All right, I hope everybody is safe and happy and healthy. I'm feeling good. I've actually been able to get out a little bit. Visited Atlanta Botanic Garden Gainesville recently and was just down at the South Carolina Botanic Garden, which is the, the garden at Clemson, which is a really fantastic place. Their director is getting ready to leave and he's going to go to the West Coast and become director of Heronswood Garden. So Dan Hinckley's the garden that Dan Hinckley built. So was going down and raiding the collections before he left, but also, uh, you know, keeping up with, with good friends. So it's pretty exciting because we consider Heronswood kind of a sister garden. So really excited for them. They've got a great person going out there. So today I'm going to talk a little bit, a uh, little bit about something different. It's not going to be so much of a plant talk, more of, I guess, a, a travel talk. Back in 2005, I was working at a different garden and we were building a new area. And one of the things we were doing was connecting different ecosystems with people either present or in the past. We had done, we were doing a, a like Greek island Mediterranean thing. And we had connected that with the you know, Greek myth and, and things like that. So we were growing, you know, pomegranates to tell, yeah, it was part of the story of Demeter and the other one who went down to Hades, whose name I can't remember now. But, but doing those kind of things. And one of the, we were doing a tropical rainforest and we really wanted to connect the, what, what was going on currently in, in the tropics with a, a particular group and not generalized. So somebody I worked with had, had at a previous garden, at Fairchild Botanic Garden, had worked with an ethnobotanist and a group called the Chachi. The Chachi are an indigenous, indigenous people from kind of Northwest Ecuador. They're mostly along the Rio Cayapas and in the Cotacachi Cayapas ecological reserve. So uh, it was a group that we were going to go down there and meet. So we arranged to travel down there with this ethnobotanist and with a former Peace Corps worker who had spent about 13 years living among the Chachi. So now there are estimates vary. It's kind of hard to count uh, people like this, but there are about three to 8,000 Chachi still living, still existing out there. And they are mostly pretty, uh, you know, subsistence living kind of folks. They do, you know, they, they're, they're close enough to cities that they can get in uh, in a day and get to some small, uh, some kind of port towns. They go down, they use the river kind of as their road. But they're, they're a fascinating group. They really, you know, love the rainforest, really understand its importance are really looking at build, building up, you know, ecotourism type things because the, the government, you know, keeps doing things like selling mineral rights and oil rights under the, this biological hotspot. It's one of the, the most diverse areas in the world. And the, the government has not been very good about trying to protect it. So they are, the people live in small villages and it's kind of funny uh, as you, you go up the river, maybe I'll just start sharing screens so you're not looking at me. You can see some, some pretty pictures. It's coming through, Mark. All right, thank you. 
So the, the, the Chachi people, well, let me go back before I go down there and talk about Ecuador because this blew me away because we tend to be so Eurocentric and look mostly at the Northern hemisphere, even when we're looking at a globe, I was blown away when I realized that we are due north of Ecuador. In fact, the, the western part of Ecuador is farther west than our coastline, excuse me, the eastern part of Ecuador. So it's the same time zone. So it makes for very easy traveling. And so this is Ecuador. Uh, you can see it's got a range of mountains. Uh, you know, the, the Andes come, come all the way down through here. Quito is right up here. It's the, the second highest capital in the world. And on this side, you have the, the beginnings of the, you know, the Amazon rainforest uh, in here. And then on this side, you have rainforest, but it's not the Amazonian rainforest because it's different watersheds. And where I was, seeing this little inset map, is up here in the north side of Ecuador, which I didn't realize until I, we got there that we were very close to the Colombian border. And this was 2005. And in 2005, there was still a lot of issues with FARC and people being kidnapped and things. And at this time, they were really moving out of Colombia and into northern Ecuador because it was safer for the guerrillas, these armed guerrillas, to operate kind of with impunity in there. Didn't realize that until afterwards. But we flew into Quito, drove down to the coast, and then drove up to an area called Bourbon, which is on the coast up here, and then came in through the Rio Cayapas, so this area. And you can see this Rio Cayapas is where we were. We came in here and did go all the way into on re the Rio San Miguel into this reserve. And, and I'll show you a little bit of that as well. So if you've, if you've ever been to Quito, we may have some people who traveled with me this past winter to, to Ecuador. Quito is situated in a, an old volcano caldera. It is very high up in the air. People often have, have, you know, start getting some altitude sickness there. I couldn't find the, I have a picture, I couldn't find it, where you can actually see a, a you know, like a jumbo jet down here that's flying into the city. And this is up on top of a volcano looking down. It's surrounded by several volcanoes. Quito is. So when you leave Quito, you always have to drive up and then drive down. Or better yet, if you go to Q if you go fly into Quito and then fly down to, to Lowlands, because to get down, you ride in in buses. And since we were with somebody who had been in the, the Peace Corps, she didn't see any need for us to, you know, rent a vehicle or anything like that. So we rode in same bus that all the the locals were in so you know there were people taking their you know like who had lived out in the rainforest and came to Quito to shop and things like that and we're going back and as you go down you know this is yeah this is pretty safe because the kid isn't sitting on the the tailgate of the of the truck which you saw a lot of and, you know, you saw a lot of this driving down. And often on the other side, you wouldn't even be able to see it, but you could see where something had gone off the road and tumbled down. In fact, this, this truck may not have started here. It might have started up the hill and, and come down on the road as it, as it winds its way around. But it's, it's pretty unnerving if you're not used to this sort of thing. Um, and when we got to the coast, we thought, oh my goodness, this is fantastic. We, we stayed at a little place that was, you know, 
coconut palms on white sandy beaches at the ocean. And then we walked into town. It was a little different. This is, this is actually a, a resort area for Ecuadorians, you know, and this is, this is kind of the, the restaurant row here. These are all mostly all different restaurants. You, you can tell which that they're different restaurants by the tablecloths they have on. Every time the tablecloth changed, it was a different restaurant. So you could go here and they might have ceviche and over here, this restaurant may be doing some kind of fish. All of them, it was all basically seafood, which is kind of interesting if you're used to your restaurants, especially your seafood restaurants having refrigeration or power or running water. You know, these are all filled with with water from somewhere. So it was, it was a little odd. I actually, somebody walked by on the beach while I was out on the beach. They had like a cart on wheels and were selling ceviche out in the broiling <laughs> sun out of this cart. I had some, it was pretty good. Figure if you're gonna go, you might as well go all the way, right? Nothing like a little beach ceviche in an Ecuadorian village. We stayed, I did stay away from the water though. The beer was okay. The water you want to watch out for. But we were only there for a day or two before driving to where we were going to take our canoe into the, into the rainforest. And, you know, this is how we traveled for several hours on the road was in the, the bed of this truck. And since we were going in and we were going to be bringing the three of us from the garden I worked at, but we were also meeting up with the F ethnobotanist from Florida International University and we were bringing in the the woman who was a Peace Corps worker with us so we were, we were we were bringing in five people you can't go into a place like that and expect them to be able to feed you so we actually bought food and gas for the stoves for cooking you know, all the water, you know, a lot of water. We boiled water as well, but, you know, sacks of rice, everything to get into, you know, to bring in uh, with us. And got to our jumping off point, a place that the, the, the ethnobotanist said is the worst place in the world. That was, that was how he characterized it. And I am not sure if it's the worst place in the world, but it was this town, I mean, open, this sewers, trash everywhere, buildings falling down, very, very poor. And, uh, you know, people walked around with machetes and all kinds of things. And, and we basically got off the truck and loaded up our canoe and left. Um, we did not want to hang out there for too terribly long. And we're happy to say goodbye to Bourbon. They do get TV there though, so that's something. And this is basically right up on the river. So you, you go up the, the Rio Chiapas and they'll motor you up. Once you're up around the villages, you mostly move around by canoe that's that's paddled and it's interesting as you travel up the river you know um, on these canoes this is what you travel with in, in the towns and their their paddles were these long things are mostly eight or ten feet long out of very hard wood with a, a, a small paddle that comes down to a sharp point and so they jam it in the the ground whenever they you know, are, are at, you know, on shore, but then they use it to paddle, but even more than paddle, they just use it to pull the, the canoe up and down the river because it's very shallow except in the, the rainy season. But, you know, it's, you can see people have a different, you know, they move at a different pace, uh, which is very nice. But as you go up the river, you'll see little villages scattered along the river and there would always be I would always notice that there'd be 
one village and then almost directly across from it, another village or a little ways up, up the river on the same side of, of, the, um, of the river, but usually on opposite sides, there'd be another village. So we might go for a while without seeing any villages and then there'd be two and then go for a little while longer and there'd be another two. And what it was were, there were Chachi villages where they, they kind of, it was only Chachi in those villages. And then there'd be, the other village would be Afro uh, Ecuadorian, mostly slaves that had escaped originally and then freed, but who moved up the rivers to, to avoid being recaptured and set up uh, villages, but they weren't allowed to set up village to, to live with the Chachi, so they, they lived a little way separate. And the Chachi are very, very concerned about their, their uh, traditions and their, their, their tribe. Chachi actually means pure. The, they were called Kayapas for a while, which means kind of like father's son. And they changed that to, to Chachi. They had been moved around as a, as a people um, until they were where they are now. And the Chachi Federation, uh, they still speak, uh, their main language is Chapla Achi. The, the title for this was Urakepe, which means hello. Urakepe Nene means good morning. And we, we all learned that. And so we'd be in a village and we'd say, Urukepe, Urukepe Nene. And the kids would laugh at us. And then they would say, hello, how are you? And we would always, you know, answer, I'm very good. How are you? And just like us, all they knew was, hello, how are you in English? And all we knew was Urukepe Nene. And so we communicated about that same level. But they also speak Spanish. Spanish is the national language of Ecuador, and so they're, they're all taught Spanish. But the Chachi, if, if say, uh, you, you're Chachi and you want to marry somebody from one of the, the Black villages, you can do that, but you'll be, you'll be kicked out of the village. You'll have to go live in the Black village. And you are not supposed to ever speak Chapalachi again. And we actually, one of the people who was with us for a part of the trip had married uh, a, an Afro-Ecuadorian woman and was kicked out, wasn't supposed to speak the, the native language anymore. He, one, when we were on the the we, we did it had a camping trip up to a sacred waterfall that I'll show you. Um, when we were there, he was with other Chachi and they let him speak Chapla Achi while we were there. But once we were back in town, nope, it wasn't not allowed. And they used the river for everything. If you go out in the mornings, you'll see kids polling, you know, boats to to get to wherever the, their school is, which might be an hour or more away. You know, they'll have a school in, in kind of a central village and then everybody comes, comes there. And there'll be sometimes be just, you know, little, little houses by themselves. One of our guides we picked up on the way and he just lived out by himself, his family. And on the, the right, this is kind of the more traditional house. And this is the, the slight, the more modern with plank and, and um, the metal roof. And he was fairly near Bourbon, so it was not, as we went farther in, you didn't see that metal roof much. And, you know, this was, this was pretty typical. A, a set of a stairs, either in concrete or just in the mud where the canoes were, were kept, and then you'd go up and usually a central, there'd be a central area that was kind of flat, often, often with concrete, and they would put cacao out there, 
chocolate, the seed to dry. Probably one of these buildings is a church and doubles as a meeting place, perhaps this one, and then people would live around there. And this is where I stay. This was kind of our base of operations was San Miguel, which is a really, it was a really lovely little, little town. Now these are, this is kind of more modern, um, what you see, you know, the metal roofs and the, the planks. Traditionally, the, the Chachi houses are, it's a thatched roof with half walls or no walls. And in the Chaplachi language, uh, there is no word for, for privacy. It's kind of a foreign concept or it was before they were converted to Catholicism and taught by ministers and things like that. So now they, you know, now they under, they are more private, but they still, when you go up into the villages, traditionally women, the women don't, women and men don't wear shirts. And it's still the case, especially with older women, but yeah, it would, it was not uncommon, you know, for that, to, for that to be the case. And, you know, like everywhere, you know, kids are kind of the same wherever you go in the world, uh, which makes them a lot of fun because the same thing that'll make a kid in Raleigh laugh at you, uh, will make uh, a kid in the rainforest of Ecuador laugh at you as well. And we were, we were going up we were doing this so we could, our goal was to have, get the Chachi to collect all the materials to build a house and to get handicrafts from them. They re they're really known for their basketry and their weaving, but get just all kinds of the things that they use in their everyday lives to put into this exhibit. And the goal was then to have a group of Chachi come to the U.S. and actually build the house and talk with, you know, give, give talks and, and things and um, try and generate some revenue to bring back. So we were purchasing materials from them, but also, you know, kind of had some, some bigger, bigger plans. But we did bring, we brought a bunch of all kinds of things that, that were requested to distribute through the villages, maps, uh, you know, Spanish language maps of the world and books in Spanish and, you know, pencils and paper and, you know, all those kinds of things. Uh, but we also brought a bunch of soccer balls and what they said, the most, the thing that people will, the kids would be the most happy, or kids and adults really, would be the most happy for us to bring to them were tire pump needles. The, you know, the needle breaks and you can't pump up the soccer ball anymore. So we brought a bunch of, just a ton of, of pump needles and some small pumps as well. And we would leave those every village that we visited. We'd leave them a few and um, some soccer balls and frisbees and things like that and clothes that I tell you as somebody who travels a lot one of the greatest inventions for traveling to places like this has got to be the digital camera because we could take a picture and then we could show them the picture immediately and they just love that they love that and, you know, of course, if you took one person's picture, you had to take every single person's picture as well. But you can see the, the weaving, they, they weave baskets, fans, kind of everything they, they do uh, this very, this, this weaving with these specific types of reads. I never could quite figure out which ones they used or if, if it was two different things or if it was one that's treated or colored differently. Uh, nobody ever showed me the actual plant. So, 
And you know, this, here you go. This is the most important tool there. Everything's done with a machete, everything. And you can see this is Franklin and his, his wife showing some of the basket work. And this is kind of the typical thing, an open basket like this, or this is two pieces that, you know, close, if you will, you know, it's basically like two baskets, one just slightly larger than the other. But then they would do things like this basket. And I don't know how well you can tell, but it's curved and uh, it just really delicate and beautiful and placemats. And, yeah, and they, they, they take these and they bring them into Bourbon and Esmeraldas and they sell them and buy, you know, sugar and flour and seeds for crops if they need them, you know, maybe some, some treats, some clothes, uh, a new machete, uh, that kind of thing. But we went through and, you know, we kind of tried to document everything. What do their fish traps look like? How do they use them? And I spent a good couple of days just walking through villages with one of the people there and talking about the plants. This is a little more traditional. I mean, it's, it's a fancy one because it's a double decker, but this is a little bit more traditional of a, of a chachi hut that you would see. And they always built them on stilts, usually right by the river. So it's usually kind of overlooking the river. But since this is a biological hotspot, they, there had been many scientists who'd visited the area. So, you know, ethnobotanists, botanists, ornithologists, zoologists, anthropologists, would come there and would stay. This, this, this is very typical. This is, this is what you saw in most of the smaller villages. You know, there'd be, it'd be open on, usually on two sides, thatch roof that hangs over, lots of clothes out on the, the line. And I realized, I was like, gosh, are they just constantly doing laundry? Is it all? And I realized at some point that you know, they wash the clothes, they put them up there to dry, but they don't really have, most people didn't have, you know, dressers or certainly no closets. You know, the entire family is living in, is cooking and living inside, usually with no separation between rooms or anything. So I think they just left the clothes there until they used them again. Now, in the larger villages, there'd be one person who worked for the government who was kind of in charge. So, well, in the, in the Afro-Ecuadorian villages, one person who was kind of in, in charge. In the Chachi villages, they, it, there would be a, a, a chief or headman or something along those lines. But so the person who lived here worked for the government. So he had, you know, a TV and a DVD player and really big speakers. I don't know where he got these speakers from. You know, and I, I could just picture him laying in the hammock and watching TV here. But you could tell at night, you could always tell who who was the, the chief or the, the government representative in the, the, these are just in the larger towns, because there'd be a, as you're going down, there'd be a blue glow from the TV on and you could hear the generator. So he would start up this gas generator to watch his DVDs, which were all displayed right here. Because he couldn't get anything broadcast uh, like that or to listen to music, I guess. I never saw him actually using it. He did give me a Coca-Cola though. We sat in here and after he proudly showed me this and had a, had a Coke. Yeah, just more traditional housing. And you can see, if you haven't seen it before, this is, these trees are cacao, what chocolate is made from. It's real distinctive. A lot of trees in the tropics will, the new growth will come out red like this. 
And that's because the anthocyanins, the pigments, don't get burned quite as bad, you know, while the leaf is still young and tender. And then the fruit kind of hangs along the trunk and, and main branches a bit. Now, one thing that we were not warned about when we came was the bathroom situations. Now, most of the houses are built along the river. So the river bank will be 10 to 25 feet up from the, the river level. And then the houses are built on stilts from you know, three to eight feet in the air. And these houses by the river would have these bamboo planks that went from the house out over the river. So from here down to the actual river is probably on this one, it's probably pretty low and this is probably 25 feet. And some of them were easily 50 feet up. And this is a nice wide one as well. Some of them were like three pieces of bamboo uh, lashed together and they would kind of bounce as you walked on them. And that's the bathroom. So you have your ch choice of going out in broad daylight or pitch black and neither one of those were a lot of fun to do out there in the, the when we were in these villages. That this is picture taken on a canoe as we were going by, so it's pretty quick. But so I spent the entire day one day with one of our guides, uh, Franklin, whose wife made all those, those baskets I showed. And we would walk around and we would stop at a plant and he would look at it and he would, he would turn to me, he would say, Anonesii, Anonis, which was just the Latin. He had worked with these, with botanists, uh, you know, for months and gotten to know, he mostly knew family, plant families, but sometimes he could give me the genus as well. And then he would kind of if, if the fruit, if, if it was like a fruiting plant and the fruit was right, he would take it down and show me what they ate of it. If it wasn't, he would still mimic what they used it for, either for eating, or sometimes he would show me that, you know, this plant is used for, you know, thatching roofs or repairing the thatch on a roof, or maybe it's used to make uh, fish traps or, whatever he would show me whatever it was you know i was really excited to try breadfruit it was something that you know i had read in some sort of you know lewis stevenson type novel about you know shipwrecked people eating breadfruit um, and breadfruit trees are some of one of the maybe the prettiest tropical tree there is. And then these fruits get to be simply enormous and you roast it. And if you were stuck on a tropical island for maybe a couple of years, then the breadfruit definitely does resemble bread in taste and texture. If you have not lived on a tropical island for a couple of years, eh, not quite <laughs> the taste of bread, of, uh, of, fresh oven baked bread, but still good. But this was a, what a lot of the gardens would look like. It would just be a kind of plant scattered around. And actually the garden goes back here where it's all green. That's just, you know, kind of the beginnings of forest. This is cleared because it's around the, the house and the chickens are always in it and kids are playing around and things like that. But if you going in here, you would, there'd be, you know, five or six pineapple plants and you know and if he's in a village his house he may have you know this might not be his coconut tree he may have one that's over somewhere else right by somebody else's house but it would be his his coconut tree and other people wouldn't go up, would not climb up there and take his coconuts off of there and same thing with the plants although some some of the cacao they would do kind of as a group or um, sometimes pineapple, but it was, it was fascinating that, you know, everything didn't have to be laid out in rows. It was, yeah, just wherever the space was. 
and they did a lot of things in raised beds. We were going around and we were looking at, they did a lot of the vegetables in the raised beds. So we were going around and like I said, he'd been showing me stuff and, and I would try it, you know, he'd pull an onion out and I'd eat it or something like that. And we go by one of these raised beds and there are peppers growing on it. And there's a guy sitting up at his house just watching us. And he's seen me eating things. And, you know, I, of course, the vegetables I've mostly recognized and, but they don't know, they don't know what I know, what I don't know. So the guy who's guiding me around is telling me that they eat it. And I was asking him, is it, you know, I don't know Spanish. So the closest I knew to hot or spicy is caliente. <laughs> I say, is it caliente? And he's like, no. And the guy who's sitting up on his, his balcony is laughing and he's going, he's miming to me to eat it, you know, eat it, eat it, eat it. And so finally I was, I was like, since I couldn't get spicy out, I was like waving my hand in front of my mouth, like my mouth's on fire. It's so spicy. And the guy almost fell off of his, his deck laughing so hard. He really wanted me to eat those, uh, those hot peppers. They did. And sometimes the raised beds would be like a canoe that had cracked, had a big crack in it and wasn't usable anymore. They just put it up on some posts and fill it with soil and plant in it. And they would go out into the rainforest, you know, and find, you know, this is a Bactris palm. So he would go out and he'd collect the fruit from Bactris palm, which is real starchy, but it's okay. I ate that. I ate that and washed it down with a coat with the the head man there. And you know, almost all their food they grew or it came from the river. They really uh, uh, did a lot from the river. Um, fish, these huge shrimp. So we um, when we stayed there, there were women who would come and cook for us every day. They'd cook us breakfast. If we were there at lunch, they would cook us lunch. If we were there at dinner, they would cook us dinner. And they would cook us just this mountain of rice. We'd each get a plate and be a mountain of rice. And there would be, you know, we'd get three or four of these shrimp on there or big pieces of chicken. And there'd be a lot of beans and a lot of plantains and, you know, the other stuff we bought. They always kind of fix things in ways that, that were kind of different for me, but were always delicious. The food was so good. And so the first day or two, we're just eating all the food. And I'm like, yeah, I wish, I wish I wouldn't cook so much. This is just way too much food for me. And the, the Peace Corps worker who was with us said, she said, well, whatever y'all don't eat, the women will take home for their, their families, for their children. And, you know, the next meal, you know, I get this big mountain of, of rice and beans and, you know, several giant shrimp, you know, I cut a shrimp in half and I eat that and I eat some beans and I eat some rice. I'm like, oh, that was so good. I'm full. And you could see all of us, you know, stop trying to eat all this food they were given to us and tried to eat as little as possible. So it would go to the, their families. We did pay them for, you know, the cooking and everything as well. But uh, you know, this was, it was a treat having us there. Now, one of the things that they really wanted us to do was go visit this, there uh, had a sacred waterfall in the reserve. And they said, before we go, we had to be blessed. So we had been in the, in town, the, the Peace Corps worker had bought a bottle of cane liquor, which is like rum without any of the finesse, and a couple of packs of cigarettes. I'm like, all right, whatever. So apparently, what you need to do if you're going to be blessed by a shaman, and he, this was the last shaman in the area, was you were supposed to bring an offering of alcohol and tobacco, and traditionally had been kind of Wo tobacco that's kind of woven almost into a rope that's coiled up but I guess the cigarettes work as well and we went in we all sat on the floor around him and 
he and his son chatted with each other a little bit and his son told us that he would bless us for, you know, I forget what, $20 a piece, $10 a piece, something like that. And they chatted some more and then he chatted at us and I'm not sure what he was saying. And then he would motion for one of us to come up and stand in front of him or sit in front of him, I guess. And he would take one of these bundles of, of leaves and smack us on the head and shoulders with it while he's talking to us and he do that. And then we go sit back down and it's getting darker and darker. And you have to remember this is one room and there are about, I don't know how many other people in there and they're just, you know, babies are sleeping, people are having conversations, they're cooking dinner. There's no privacy. It's just a one room house. Everybody, you know, sleeps in there in that same room and everything. And then every once in a while, the son would pour out little shots of this cane liquor and pass it around to us or light a cigarette and pass it to us. And, you know, we didn't know if he was being just hospitable and offering us a cigarette and, and a shot or if that was part of the ritual. So every time, you know, so there we all are smoking cigarettes and taking shots of cane liquor. And then after we did that for a while, we would come back up and he'd smack us a, a bit more with the leaves. But then he started taking swallows out of the, the bottle and spitting it on us over us as well. Somewhere there's video of the whole thing, but nobody can seem to find it at, at the garden where we were, which is unfortunate because I'd love to be able to see it and show it because it was, it was crazy. Felt crazy, but it was worth it going up into the, the rainforest was, was just incredible experience. Now the woman who was with us could not come. Women were not allowed up to this sacred waterfall, only men. And you know, it was, it was pretty extreme. It, it wore me out. That's, you know, I thought I knew humidity coming from the Southeast. I knew nothing about humidity until I, I hiked straight up in, uh, at the equator for many hours. But the plants were just incredible. And when we finally got up to this level area, we actually, our campus set off just to the left of, of the screen there and they wouldn't let us help so the ethnobotanist who was with us sat down and I thought he was going to die. And Patrick and I started walking down the stream. It was between maybe thigh deep and ankle deep. And we just, I mean, it was just so gorgeous. We just kept walking and walking and walking. Find, seeing fish and tadpoles and birds and all these crazy plants all over the place. And it started getting dark and we started thinking, you know, we probably ought to get back. I don't know if I want to be walking down this stream when it's pitch black. And we rounded a corner and it was a point where the, the stream stayed pretty consistently 12 to 15 feet wide. We came around to a spot that was about the same as all the rest of it. And I don't have a picture of it, but in your head picture, the head of a snake we can't see because it's up on this side of the bank and the tail we can't see because it's up on this side and it's moving across so this snake was at a minimum 15 feet long and you know in my memory it was you know as big around as my thigh perhaps it wasn't that big around but it was some kind of large constrictor and then we said, yeah, let's definitely get back to, to, to the campsite. And let me tell you, there was a lot less looking at plants on the way back and a lot more looking out for snakes that might drop out of the trees and, and get us. Yeah, but, uh, you know, camp was a nice little cozy thing. It is the rainforest and it does rain often but our guys knew what to do. They knocked up some little benches for us to sit on, made a little cover over the, the fire and uh, we, we survived. 
out there. But we were out, but this was home base for, for a few days for us. You know, it's the big treat for, for them. They would cook rice. You know, you had eat rice with everything. We'd cook rice, but they would burn some of it on the bottom. And we'd all eat the rice. And then they kind of break out the pieces, the burnt pieces on the bottom and eat them like, like popcorn. And uh, they, they always were very generous and wanting to share that with us, but we let them go ahead and have it. And the plants, oh my gosh, all the Jesneriads, the African violet relatives, you know, things like this, which, you know, looks like a, you know, Syningia, Gloxinia, something I would, you know, grow in a conservatory or a, a pot on my windowsill. But then things like this, this is another Jesneriad, much different looking with these colorful leaves, things related to Tibicina, this is Melastoma ACE, which is, you know, as good as either I or our guides could tell us, Melastoma ACE. But we would, as we'd walk, they'd sometimes, you know, kind of reach out, reach out as we're walking by or maybe dart off the path a little bit and they'd pull a few fruits off of a plant that was out there and hand it to us to eat and it's just very, it's so cool. All the bromeliads, the guzmanias, and other things. Labdesia. I just recently figured out what that was. Orchids. I mean, it really was just this botanical wonderland. But very, you know, very few flowers. It's mostly green that you're, you're going through. Now, this was neat. So we had gone up from our camp, and we were hiking up. What I felt like hiking up, what I, what, to me was a tremendously steep path with very big air quotes around path. And we got here and we stopped and they pointed this out. And I'm like, you know, what is this, a horse trough? What on earth? What this is, is a grinding stone. And he, here they very helpfully told us that the, the people who walked on the path um, that we were just about to get on, which was actually more of a path, because the path became so steep, on either side of it, uh, of the, the hill that we were gonna climb, they had, there's, there's a stone that over the years had been worn out from grinding, I don't know exactly what the process is, but grinding basically uh, potash, lime, to, which is what you take a coca leaf and you wrap it around the, the lime that's been crushed and chew it. And some, they use this for some part of the process and they do it, make sure they have enough. And, you know, when you're carrying heavy weight going over this steep hill, it helps chewing on a coca leaf. Gives you energy, a little pep in your step. They did not have any coca for us. So we went from what to them was the flat path that I thought was steep to the steep path to get up to the top of the waterfall. I, I, and I'm a, I, I do not have pictures of the waterfall because we climbed up to the top of the waterfall and is, you can't really take a picture down a waterfall very, very well, not without risking going over it. And because of how dense the jungle was, you could hear the waterfall, but you couldn't see it from below at all. I'm just not even a little bit, so I don't have pictures. But, you know, in addition to the plants or things like, you know, poison dart frogs, the dendrobates that would be out there. Oh, they, they were so, so cool. Millipedes, you know, eight inch long millipede that looks like some kind of armored space thing a tadpole. That's, that's what these huge tadpoles. And that's not even my little hand. That's, that's Patricio, as they called Patrick. That's his big old six, four self holding that, that tadpole. And now this was interesting. I, I never saw a one of these until they pointed them out. This is, they called it a Garda. Some, something, gar basically, the, the name translates to guard of the path or guard of the road. And it curls up right in the middle of pathways. And man, you could not see this thing. They would stop us all and they would point it out. 
and I'd look and look and I'm, I grew up out in the woods in the Southeast, you know, I can see snakes, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the one pointing them out to, to people. I, I would, they would have to almost come up to the point where they were touching it before I would see it. And so I got, I'm going to take a little detour on, on my story now. When we got to Quito, we met up with this, the, the Peace Corps person who was crazy as all get out. She was loony, but she had bought some stuff for us that without telling us that we had to pay her back for, including this, she brought this black case that was, you know, you know, I don't know, like a toolbox size. And she opened it up and inside there is this big contraption. We were like, what is this? She said, this is a stun gun. I said, why do we need a stun gun? It's not going to be that dangerous where we're going, is it? She said, the stun, stun gun is for snake bites. Like if you get bit by, it, there were three snakes, but two in particular, this one and the one that was real small. So if you get bit by it, even if you are close to one of the villages, there is virtually no chance of getting you somewhere where they will have uh, the anti-venom for you. Your best, best case scenario, if you are in a village and you're close enough to somewhere where they can call in to get a helicopter out, the best case scenario is you'll lose a leg. But that is the absolute best case scenario. You will likely die. So, you know, yikes. But she said, so you take this stun gun, and you get bit by a snake, you, you, you know, do the stun gun right where you were bit. And the theory is, I don't know how well proven it is, but the theory is it'll basically cook all the proteins in the venom and keep them from spreading out and, you know, should save your life. Uh, we did not test that out. But the funny thing was she, she taught Patrick, the youngest guy there that was with us, how to use the stun gun. She never taught anybody else. And he kept going, but what happens if I'm bit? <laughs> what happens? She said, oh, it'll be fine. You can tell them. But so after she gave us this, she'd given us a few other things to take in with us. She, after she gave us this stun gun, she handed, a, she handed me a black rock. And she said, you get the black rock. And I said, okay. And this is just like this smooth black river pebble fit comfortably in the palm of my hand. And she said, in addition to the snakes, there is an ant and it's mostly solitary ant. It's uh, about two inches long. It's a big old thing. He said, if it bites you, it will be the most painful thing you have ever felt. It is excruciating. I don't think it, unless you wind up being allergic to it, I don't think there's any other harm from it. But she said, it is just, it is, it is the most painful thing. And it'll last for a fair amount of time, you know, for days potentially she said, but if you get bit by that spider uh, by that ant you just put the black rock on top of it and it'll take away the pain so at one point when we were hiking out of the hiking out from this um getting back to the canoes after we'd been in the the jungle for a few days one of the guides points out this great big honking ant walking down a you know the trunk of a tree and I was like, oh, is that the one that bites you and hurts? And he kind of pantomimes, like hopping around, like holding onto his hand, um, like he's in pain and, you know, crying and everything. And so the, the young guy who was with me, Patricio, I was like, come on, Patrick, you got to do it for science. You got to let this thing bite you so we can see if the black rock works because it's just a black rock. It's not doing anything. I was like, you have got to. And boy, I was so close to letting him let that, that ant bite him, but he just, he, he never, he wouldn't pull the trigger. I still give him a hard time about that. 
these were our guys. There's, there's Franklin who, who showed me around the village and Sanin and Manuel. And these guys were, were just fantastic. If you saw a bird and wanted to know what it was, the Latin name, Franklin could tell you about it. Manuel was better with the plants. Sanin was kind of, he was kind of good all around. Uh, he was the one who kept grabbing food for us to eat out of the, the rainforest. He lives by himself. He doesn't live in a village. So I think he does a lot more uh, just kind of subsistence living. Um, but man, they knew their stuff and they, they would carry, they carried the bulk of the stuff we brought with us. No problem at all. And they were great. Of course, you know, we got to know all the people in both the, the Chachi villages where we stayed in uh, San Miguel and the Afro-Ecuadorian village, Loma Linda, uh, right beside there. And on our going away uh, in Loma, Loma Linda, they, they had a big old party for us. And they had uh, you know, marimbas and drums and guitars. And this were in the, the church. They moved all the, the, the benches out of the church. And man, we partied. Everybody danced and people sang. The you can see, and everybody came from both villages. But you can see the the um, the Chachi kind of standing in the corner. They're very, very reserved, very, very shy. They did not get out there and dance with us. But man, we were out there, and it is a thousand degrees. There's a generator running. They're playing music. You got to, got to have the lights on with the generator. And it felt like it was a thousand degrees in there and they would, you would dance and dance and we, you'd sit back down and then somebody else, one, one of these two, especially, but it, it, all kinds of people would come over and they'd, they'd get you and make you get back up and keep dancing. And, and everybody wanted to dance with Patricia. Everybody loved Patricio. But we, we managed to manage to, uh, for it all to work out some months later. So that was August. You can see this is, this is probably coming into spring, I think. I can't remember when it actually, the stuff showed up, but they, um, tractor trailer, uh, showed up and in it were all of the, you know, the things that we had asked them to, to do for us a whole, just, I mean, a tractor trailer, a, material to build an entire hut, these fish traps, and these, these are traps for, mostly for spiny rats, uh, is what they call them, they're, they're jungle rats, which are delicious. They had these, some big weavings that we had, bags full of fans and baskets and, and things like that. Uh, there's a little canoe, some little spears, kind of like play size spears. We got full size canoes um, out of there. Uh, it was it was pretty pretty flipping cool. And then then the next step was to get these these people up who we were all wanted to see. Get them to come up and build the hut for us. And you know we were really going to do a lot of fundraising form and everything. And so the, the Peace Corps worker was back down in Ecuador. We paid for all this material. And, you know, she's one of those people that doesn't trust the government. So she, when she went to the embassy, she wouldn't tell them the truth about what they were doing up here. You know, if she had done that and connected them with us, we would have had no problem. We, you know, we knew the Ecuadorian ambassador who was out in Norfolk area and, you know, the American ambassador, we could have made this all work, but she lied to them about something. And so we never could get all the folks out, but thankfully I've taken a lot of pictures so that our, our maintenance crew actually built a pretty, pretty good traditional Ecuadorian hut out there. And then I got some paddles and the fish traps hanging down and kids could go up there and look at it. I don't know if it's still there or not. Um, that was, 
2006, so who knows. But it wound up being being pretty pretty cool trip. You know, I learned a lot from down there. I learned that iguana does not taste like chicken, but it's not too bad. Um, it's certainly something that Florida could do with their iguana problem is start eating them. They, they, they were okay. And, and I got to meet some fantastic people. So I am taking this picture. Some Actually, that's, I don't know. We're in the back of the truck. This is on our way to to Bourbon to get the get the canoe, and we stopped and we picked up this gentleman. That's another Manuel. He is one of three at the time in 2005, one of three Chachi who had gone to college. There was a doctor who had gone to college who we didn't meet. There was Manuel, and there was one other person who we didn't meet. Manuel lived up, lived out of the rainforest, and he was he was kind of the government liaison with the Chachi Federation and and some other small even smaller indigenous tribes who didn't have anybody who could really do that function. So we stopped to pick him up. There's the Peace Corps lady, crazy woman. Picked up his wife Lydia, who is one of my favorite people in the world and his two children because his parents lived in the still lived up the Rio Chiapas. His father was a chief in a village not where we stayed but just a little farther up the river and so they got in the back we picked them up and they get in and you know we got Bob Esponja. They love Spongebob down there. Don't know why but they seem to love him. And, you know, they've got a couple bags of clothes in there. And then they have, you know, with this box and inside there, you can see the little hole. There's, I don't know, three, four, five, six little chicks in there that they're bringing, he's bringing to his parents because chickens are great. They eat insects, they lay eggs, fantastic. Couldn't ask for, you know, a better gift for somebody who's living in the rainforest. And then there was a bag I looked at, you know, he let me look in it and it had three different cultivars of croton, you know, the house plant croton, the speckled leaves things, ones with red and yellow and whatever in there. And so what he was bringing to his parents who live in the rainforest were, were chickens that produce food and ornamental plants. Croton are poisonous, that you, you can't eat them. There's nothing about them that's good. They're just cool looking plants. And so that's what he was bringing his parents were ornamental plants and that just that just blew me away and then i got there and you know you're walking around these places where it's just poor as can be you know a lot of times kids have have rickets they're they're really it's it's you know subsistence living and you know you'll see where they've built a little container out of out of some old bamboo and have vinca growing in it there's one person who showed me that they had a, don't know how they got it, but they had a big leaf hydrangea, hydrangea macrophylla, the Asian plant that we, you know, that we all love, the big blue and pink flowered hydrangeas. It didn't look like it was ever going to flower in the tropics. It was not happy there, but they had it growing. It was, it was amazing, uh, you know, and one of the first things I saw when we climbed up the stairs from, from down by the canoe, I see this. So here's a person who's got crotons out here, and these are all different ones. You know, they're ones with narrow leaves and fat leaves and ones with curly leaves. And this porch, you know, this Tradescantia in this plastic bucket, this could have been on my, I mean, literally, if you had just shown me that plant and said, this was on your grandmother's front porch in, in New Orleans, I would have said, yeah, checks out. I remember her growing little plants like this and like the peperomias in, you know, old coffee cans and plastic buckets and things out on the porch, just like this. And so it really, it really hit home for me that no matter where you are, no matter what your, you know, as long as you're meeting your very, very basis, basic needs of 
food and shelter. That gardening and ornamental plants, you know, are a, a universal, a, a universal kind of um, desire, a universal, and we want to surround ourselves with, with beauty. And that's something that helps connect us to nature, even when you're very, very connected to nature, like they are here. It's, you know, it really, it, it was, it was powerful for me to, to see how important ornamental, ornamental plants are. As we walked around the gardens, looking at all these useful plants, sometimes I would point to a tree and they would just kind of ship, kind of make a motion that it had flowers, but that was, that was it. And I just thought that was the coolest thing. This incidentally, this pad is where during the season when they're harvesting a lot of cacao though, and it's the dry season, they'll put it out here to dry, but they don't want it to get rained on. So other times of year, they, they put it inside, but they also, they play soccer here on this. And then there's another field where they play soccer. Now, if, if they're not working, they're, they're playing soccer. So that was it. I am happy to answer any questions people might have. I'm guessing there might be some questions that Chris didn't um, know the answer to. There were questions in the chat. I couldn't answer a single one. And my Zoom died, so I have lost the entire chat. I remember a couple of them. I've got chat. I've got the chat. <laughs> All right. Somebody said, electricity, I saw overhead wires in your photos. That Anywhere where you saw wires, electric wires in the photos would have been on one of the, from one of the coastal areas like Esmeraldas or Bourbon, and they did have electricity there. Esmeraldas was very interesting. That was the place I showed you with the beautiful white sand and palm trees. It is, it is very much resort town for Ecuadorians. And we stayed at what was, I'm told, a, one of a very nice Ecuador, you know, a very nice hotel there. And somewhere I have a picture of the shower, which was is just a pipe sticking out of the <laughs> out of the wall and the water pressure there was basically non-existent so you were you know standing under this dribbling dribbling uh, hose what's the most common religion catholicism it's all catholicism this is you know it's a spanish you know spanish influenced country so i mean i'm sure there are other religions but outhouse with a question mark most of what I saw, it was out over the river on those little planks out hanging over the river. So a little scary. Can we order those lovely baskets? You know, we had gotten all those things with the idea that we would be able to sell a ton of them when we had the Chachi come in and build this thing. It was gonna, we were really going to build up, you know, that they were here and do a whole thing and have speakers around it. And that never really panned out. And, you know, I honestly don't know what happened to all those things and they weren't sold. So maybe I need to get in touch with them and see if, see if they're still around. Cause I would actually love to have some of the items. What is the roof material? Roof material is traditionally is uh, it's palm fronds, but there's, but interestingly, whenever they would patch the roofs, they did it with this, with an, a different type of plant called Carludovica. And the specific Carludovica they, they had, they used would be, had very white backsides. And so they would, the, they would, it would really stand out. You know, closer in towards the coast, uh, they, were, they used more, corrugated tin. Refrigeration, I didn't see any, I mean, there's definitely no refrigeration in, you know, in these smaller villages. I didn't see any refrigeration in Bourbon or Esmeraldas either. I take that back. 
in Esmeraldas, if you went into a restaurant that was actually a restaurant, they, they had um, refrigerated beer, but that was all of it. Somebody told me it looks like a rock lobster, not a shrimp. I will take your word for it. All I know about rock lobster is the B-52 song. So I will, I will take you, your word for it. Food from the river with the sewage didn't folks regularly get sick. You know, you build up, you build up your immunity to these things. If that's where you live, the river was pretty fast flowing and there were not many people living there. I mean, you know, each village would have, a village would have four or five houses, you know, a big village would have maybe eight. Just because of, with subsistence living, bigger groups are more difficult. Now, they w now there were multiple villages all down the river, so I suppose people certainly could get sick. You know, obviously it's not something we like to think about a whole lot today with that, that happening. What's bigger, a bigger problem was traditionally, you know, you're cooking in the house and everything you're getting, you're getting from around there. You, so you get a, a breadfruit and you've cooked it and you've peeled it. You just throw it out the, the window and it kind of goes under your, your, your house and you know the chickens pick at it and, it and you're in the rainforest so it breaks down very quickly everything breaks down very quickly well what happens when you go to town and you get plastic bag with sugar in it all of a sudden there's no trash service what you do always with what's left over from what you cook is you throw it out the window that's what you do so now there's becoming these piles of trash under people's houses because they're using more processed things, more things that come in plastic. And that's a real, that's a real problem for the, for them. They low down, do they grow rice? Low down in, in farther down towards the coast, they grow some rice. But once you get into the rainforest itself, no. Yeah, I was there in 2005. I actually, we came out of the rainforest, went back to Quito to fly out. And when we got back to Quito and got to a, we didn't have smartphones then uh, at all. Uh, we got back to Quito and could watch TV. We saw that a great big hurricane named Katrina had hit the United States right, just right then. And so, the only flights from the U.S. to 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 Quito at the time were out of Miami and Houston, and we couldn't fly on either of them. We were stuck in Quito for about an extra week because we just couldn't get back to the United States. Isn't Ecuador a bazillion feet above sea level? Um, Quito is a billion a bazillion feet above sea level, but that's just the rim of the the Andes and that you know the the volcano the quarter of volcanoes it goes all the way down to sea level. Did I say on the climb was it cacao or coca leaves they chewed on coca coca leaves that they chewed on yeah coca as in what cocaine comes from. The shrimp got to everybody. Um, the, the hut was built at the Norfolk Botanic Garden. Somebody asked privately, did they ever fall in the river from the bathroom perch? No. Well, I don't know. I never saw them. Let me tell you, I came real close to it. What other protein other than fish and iguana? They do, they'd have chickens, although they had to, the chickens would get, they wouldn't eat that until they, it was past, uh, it was no longer laying. Every once in a while, you'd see some cows. Uh, and so, but I don't know 
how much they were eating the cows. You know, what if they would have one or two. You know, I think that was more for milk. They would, yeah, they would go out in the rainforest and they would get agouti and and um, spiny rat and and other mammals or some red squirrels and things that they would eat. So yeah, some other other um, proteins. Oh yeah, yeah, B fifty twos. Yeah, rock lobster. So screens with that. Yeah, it was it was phenomenal. It really was phenomenal experience. I, you know, there, you get a little bit of the kind of summer camp kind of feeling. You you spend this what to you is a very intensive intensive period with really wonderful people, and you know it was it was painful to leave uh, when we did. Everybody, you know, were so nice, and you know anything that I could that I didn't need to have with me you know, I left, you know, I had a pocket knife and a Leatherman, you know, I left the Leatherman with Franklin, I left the pocket knife with Sanin, my rubber boots, I left those with, with somebody, I had, uh, I left packs with somebody, I actually took my stuff out in kind of this woven bag because I left my packs with people, anything, uh, you know, extra clothes we left with people, I do have a couple things. I almost forgot. So like, this is the type of basket that they would make. This was just very, very common. They also did weaving, like embroidery stuff that was really beautiful. And, and one, of my, one of the things that's in my office that nobody sees, it's up on top of my, uh, my desk, like up that way, if I'm sitting here at my desk, is this canoe. This is not the one that was in the picture. This is one that Franklin, uh, Franklin, who I spent the most time with, he carved this and out of, it's, it's balsa, so super light. He carved this and gave this to me when we were getting ready to leave. And I'm not sure, I think it may have been he felt like he needed to because I had given him several of the things that I had, I had brought with me, like the Leatherman and, and um, some, some other things for his family. And I had really spent the most time with him. So this, he returned to me. And actually, which way to go? If you see on my back wall behind me there, that long paddle, that is paddle from the Chachi. That's the kind of thing they use. I have one here and I have one at home. The little paddle underneath it is Ecuadorian as well, but not from the Chachi. That was, that was when I got on this, when I, we led a tour there uh, just this past winter. Um, somebody asked, how long was I there? It was, it was just under a month um, that we were in the rainforest and then you know almost another week stuck in uh in, in uh keto i did not have to bring the the long the long uh, uh paddle through customs that came on that in that cargo trailer they they got all the stuff to build a house built a raft out of it, loaded all the things that they were putting in the, going to put in the container, all the baskets and everything, floated it all the way down the river, out, went out on, into the, the ocean, actually, around to another town where they could load it from there right into a cargo container. And then we had the cargo container shipped to Norfolk. It was... It was wild. Now it was interesting getting that material through the inspections and customs and everything in uh, when it got to the U.S. Because as you can imagine, there's like all the thatching that was going to go on the roof. That's in that container. All the stuff and this stuff had just come from the rainforest and was put on a a cargo container. So we finally uh, we found a a garden member who was a who dealt with that kind of stuff. And he managed to get it all, the whole thing fumigated for us. So any creepy crawlies that 
hitched a ride were were uh, were killed, and that which was probably a good thing. So, thank y'all. Let me let me uh, when I, when I started this, we did not have what was up for our plant sale to, on the plant buggy tomorrow, but it is there now. If uh, y'all would like, I can share my screen one more time if people want to see what's what's there. Sure, go right ahead. All right. So here we go. We have got a uh, beautiful variegated agave shadidra. Pretty marginal here. Keep it, don't leave it outside for the this first winter at least. This great hardy rabbit's foot fern. Um, you know, the name's hard to say, but it'll form big patches. The rhizomes kind of creep along the ground. They're, you know, fuzzy like the indoor rabbit's foot fern. Very cool. Buxus harlandii, one of our very favorite boxwoods. This has very long um, leaves. It, it has, it's completely pest free or mostly pest free. It's very, very drought tolerant once it's established and buxus grow well in shade. Collinsonia japonica variety hondoensis or Kiskia japonica variety hondoensis. It's a, it's a woodland um, plant. It's uh, got kind of these, I don't know, kind of fuzzy spikes of, uh, of usually blue flowers um, in summer. It's really, it's really very cool plant. I didn't even know we were offering this plant. I didn't know we had it in the nursery. I like, don't know where it came from. A little tiny, uh, Hosta, the, the deer are going to eat your hosta down to almost nothing anyway, so you might as well start with one that's only six inches tall. But it has these real narrow, upright, kind of twisted leaves. Another hosta, Wrinkle in Time, has little wavy green leaves with, with kind of a whitish, yellowish border. Very nice Japanese form of a... a mop head hydrangea, the big leaf hydrangea, but the, the flower heads are small, but they, it does bloom with a lot of them. I, I often wonder if this is a, a hybrid because it looks, when it flowers, it just looks different than, than other big leaf hydrangeas, but it flowers a lot and it fl starts flowering early and it's a really good plant. You got a mangave, beautiful mangave jaguar, needs to come inside for the winter. Platy crater, hydrangea relative. It's got little four-petaled white flowers over a long, long period. Yeah, I like this too. But on stems to about 18 inches tall, with a picture from the garden here that is at least three feet tall. So I have to see who you see about this uh, description. But these are all cuttings from our plant, which is right outside the McSwain Center. A Selaginella, which is a fern type plant, plant in the shade. It doesn't need particularly moist positions, but once it get gro gets grown, it'll just make this flat kind of mat in, in a shady spot. A uh, little tiny leaf, uh, jessamine. Uh, this is one that has gold leaves. They emerge kind of orangey and then goes gold. It'll creep across the ground like a ground cover. That's how I like it the most, the best, but it'll climb and it, you can have it climb up a pergola or a tree or whatever, ever. And then Mexican buckeye, Ungadabia. This is kind of a multi-stem shrub or a tree. You can train it into a single tree. It's got these, this is not a good picture. It gets loads of these pink flowers, which apparently are scented. Um, I didn't know that. And then good fall color. The flowers are followed by these little, uh, yeah, not little, about one inch, uh, seed pods. That's what gives it the name Mexican Buckeye. They kind of are Buckeye-esque, but it's a really neat plant. It's very, very drought tolerant as well. It's, it's a really cool selection of plants. 
So I'm happy to answer any questions about those as well, if you like. Well, anytime anybody wants to chat with me about the Chachi or uh, wants to come teach me more Chapalachi, the Chapalachi language, hey, please do it. See a question about what time are the plants put out? They, I think they're put out, they're out eight to four on Tuesday and Thursday. So eight to four. Mark, now, I would add one announced. more. Go ahead, Chris. I was just going to say the website's updated by 3 p.m. the previous day. So you'll know what's out on Tuesday and Thursday on Monday and Wednesday at 3 p.m. Usually this one was updated sometime after 2.45. Uh-oh. So what I have told people is it's updated, should be updated by noon on the day before it goes out. Okay. Well, the 18, the 18 inches now reads three feet, Mark. <laughs> All right. What I was, what, what was going to add, Mark, is an unexpected benefit of this is, I mean, I know some people that I only know through the various in-room in, in classes. Mm -hmm. um, and not only do we learn something from you when we listen to this or in Bryce's class, but I had somebody from a class who reached out to me just this session to say hi, who I only see in a class. That's so right. I would encourage people to periodically just go through the list of people who are listening to see who's there that they might want to send a private chat to. I agree. It, it yeah. you know, I had that same experience and it feels nice to, to do that. I was on a, a one of these uh, with colleagues, public horticulture colleagues and, Somebody, somebody reached out, kind of private, and you know, private chat, and said hello to me, and it felt so nice that I did exactly what you're saying. I kind of went through the whole list, and people who, you know, who were friends that I knew, you know, I'd see once a year, every other year at a, you know, at a conference. I, you know, hey, how are you doing? I hope things are going yeah. well, and you know, to about you know, eight or ten different people, hoping that I, you know, made their day just a little bit nicer the way they had for me. Yeah. And I'm going to steal one more line from you. Yep. Rum without finesse. Rum without finesse. There you go. Oh, man. <laughs> that cane liquor was tough stuff. You wouldn't think something made from sugar cane could, uh, could taste quite like that. But yeah. All right. Well, thank you all. Hopefully, I'll see you tomorrow. And... Did I say tomorrow? Yeah, you did. Next week. And I was I was quickly running through my head what was happening tomorrow, thinking, uh-oh. No. Nope. What, what did I forget? <laughs> all next week. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mark. That was awesome. Thanks, Thanks Mark. Guys. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. That was wonderful. Glad you enjoyed it, Linda. Glad you're here to share your travels from around the world. Well, it's a pleasure. You know, not everybody gets to tell everybody what they do on did over summer vacation, you know, <laughs> that's what I get to do. So thank you all. And we will see you again. Have Bye -bye. a great day.